Okay, so RubyConf, I must ask you a question, is the title of my talk. Uh, you know, the problem is I planned this part of the talk where I would say that um, I was just saying sentences because my voice usually shakes at the beginning of these, but fuck it, my voice is not shaking. So, okay, boo! <laughs> and we've already gotten the first curse word out of the way. Um, normally my body's a bit be a uh, big betrayer, but I guess it's just not going to betray me this time, which is kind of a betrayal, right, asshole? Okay, um, so we're going to start strong now. Um, years ago, I failed my PhD exams twice. How's that for starting strong? Um, and then I really, but I really wanted that piece of paper. I worked years to get the piece of paper. So I bought a PhD from a diploma mill from a sort of a semi-accredited uh, university, um, and so I do have a PhD, it's on my bookshelf at home, uh, because I'm not really proud of it. I don't even post on LinkedIn where I put all of my really important certificates. Um, and that, by the way, in the background is Tara the Goat, uh, which it's not a coincidence, she was named after me, and she's awesome. Um, but I, I clearly take LinkedIn very seriously. But uh, back in uh, the PhD years, my first mentor, uh, Jim Schiff, who really ramped up his efforts to get me passing the exams after I failed them horribly, um, he helped shape my understanding about how I learn, uh, how I process information, and how I communicate what I learn. And uh, he said to me, this is the first new goat, uh, he said to me, Tara, you like to walk around the barn before going inside. And that really sums up how I learn and uh, how I approach different things. Um, and you're all kind of discovering this during the talk as well. We're sort of walking around the barn. Um, but that description has been essential to my understanding of how I process what I'm trying to learn or can't seem to learn. And one of the reasons I'm giving this talk is because I struggle with grasping concepts more than the average person. And uh, this is a talk about learning. At all, at all levels, uh, we're always learning. Um, but at least in terms of uh, how we mentor, uh, or more informally, often peer-to-peer, -peer, how we mentor, or are mentored, and uh, how we learn about ourselves is uh, what I'm going for. Um, w my problem with learning uh, was really brought home to me again during coding boot camp. We paired with new people uh, every single day, and uh, we organized our way around the room uh, such that we started with like the slow people who wanted to go slow were at one end of the room, and the people I called the golden children were over at the other end of the room. I was like hanging out by the windows over there as far as I could get. Um, it turns out, of course, that some of my perceptions about what people knew or didn't know was wrong, but I did, I, I got a clear impression from all of the different people I was pairing with that how I was learning was, was very different. I was making progress, but it was very different. And I want to emphasize that while there was progress, that knowledge of difference can do a real number on a person. And I don't want to make this a talk about things that you can't translate into your own experiences, so you're just gonna have to trust me when I say that my, the struggle was real and it was beyond the norm. Um, so I'm just gonna stop for a moment uh, because I'm gonna tell a lot of stories, so I figure I may as well make some actual points, um, that you should learn how you learn. Um, it's essential to learn how you learn, and it's helpful if you uh, are helping someone else to learn, uh, to help them uh, figure that out. But ideally, you'll learn how you learn so that you can communicate what you need. Um, I wish I could go back uh, to those PhD exams. I feel like I have a, a better chance of advocating for myself and explaining to my professors what I would need in some different test-taking strategies in order to succeed, um, but I can't. So I want you to learn how you uh, learn so that you can communicate that with others. And then learn how you don't learn. Fail a whole bunch of times. I am very good at this. Try, uh, as it, you know, you go into code and you fail a whole lot trying to solve different things. It's the same thing with learning how you learn. And uh, what failed for you one time might succeed for you the next. And so you, you really do have to try a variety of things in order to sort that out. And I mention this 
specifically in this talk because I think um, when you work with different people and you're trying to mentor folks even informally, uh, you really need to learn to look for a variety of different ways that they are learning as well and uh, kind of modify what you're doing uh, when you can. And then um, even though some of your colleagues might attend a talk on being a good mentor, you are really the person vested with the vent vested interest in learning. And so, I, I mean, that I'm sure that is quite obvious, but um, it's, it's really, it doesn't matter if somebody comes and, and gives you the thing that tells you how you learn. It's my responsibility now to take that and communicate that with others and figure out how to make up for my weaknesses in learning. And I want to uh, make a distinction uh, between what I experience with my slow learning and um, imposter syndrome, which uh, you know I also have because I'm, I fit somewhere in that circle. Um, a key point from my PhD exam failure example is that I'm a real misfit when it comes to learning and communicating what I know. And I realize that everyone kind of thinks they're a special snowflake, and I am, uh, but we all are. Um, and that's why we all, that's why we all think that. Um, but I, I want to make sure that um, my own failure is really clear. I'm not sure why I want this so badly, uh, but I do. I want to make sure that you understand my failure, um, that it was beyond the norm, um, because prior to me failing, uh, my PhD exams, only one other person in the previous decade had failed the exams. Uh, and, and he admitted to taking a nap during the timed exams um, and, and, and then filed a grievance and was allowed to write his dissertation and continue, and I'm not bitter in the slightest. Um, I'm bitter. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I mean, this, this was big, and I have a large monthly payment that reminds me on the regular that I don't learn like other people learn, and how I learn can be expensive. And my story gets worse. Um, spoiler alert, uh, the, reason, the reason I'm sharing this uh, is that it isn't this dire for most folks, and I hope that's encouraging. Um, even if things are this dire, in similar or different ways, one can still succeed. And I say that from the stage of the national conference for my primary programming language while gainfully employed. So that's, that's my evidence of you can still succeed. That's all I got. Uh, <laughs> I really like you people. Um, Okay, also I want to make sure uh, that we have a common understanding of what I mean by the concept of uh, being a rubber duck. By the way, my friend Robin uh, drew this. She also designed the Goat User Story stickers, um, and it's so much better when it's not in VGA. You're just going to have to trust me that she's really talented. Uh, so <laughs> if you need a graphic designer. Um, the idea of a, a rubber duck, uh, I believe it originally comes from the book The Pragmatic Programmer, where a um, programmer is debugging by explaining the code line by line to a literal rubber duck. And that meaning has come to mean different things, as things do, uh, but it usually involves something inanimate or, say, someone who doesn't provide technical knowledge to the solution. Uh, many ways it's used now, you might, um, you know, start an email or a Slack message to somebody and you solve it simply through writing it out to the person. So in that way, they're kind of inanimate. Okay, back to it gets worse, as I was saying. Um, I have a new job uh, recently and I am trying to learn a ton faster and not be found out as a learning misfit. I am, uh, I wrap up my day and then I start reading code books, I'm taking online courses, I'm watching YouTube videos about coding, I'm trying to grok all the things at once. I'm also learning a new programming language, so that's part of it. Um, but my body is a betrayer. I don't know if this is true for everyone, but my body is. And it's like the more I try to keep being a learning misfit, a secret, the more my food issues flare up and I gain weight. And I mean a lot of weight. I'm really good at that. Uh, it's as if by hiding my misfitness, my body makes me confront not fitting in, in a physical way. 
and it really, it sucks. So, so now I must ask you the most obvious question. Why the fuck am I sharing expensive failures, my learning issues that are outside the norm, and food issues, of all things, at a tech conference? And I am, um, in a small part, I am using you. Um, if my own beliefs about psychology and, the how, and how it's connected to physiology are correct, then by confessing my true fears of being found out as a learning misfit, by putting those out there, I'm hoping that it might solve the problem. That, um, because I'm actually very good at losing weight when I'm not struggling with these things, and um, you're basically all being my rubber ducks right now. I, I realize you're not inanimate, but just as being part of an audience and not necessarily a dialogue with me, you are my confessor rubber ducks. I'm Jewish, by the way, which is why it's a rabbinic duck and not a priest duck. Um, so you are all being my rubber ducks right now. And the theory for me is that once this is out there, once I am explaining the problem to you, that the solution will be okay. Like, I have confessed this thing that is really difficult for me, and that hopefully will free me after I have a praline. I want one praline, and then I want to be freed <laughs> from, from the sugar. Just one. That's all I want. Okay, um, another reason for sharing my personal shit with you is that we are all vulnerable meat sacks. We are all vulnerable meat sacks. And we might have come to this room or this talk for different reasons, but a key reason that I'm up here is so that you have knowledge rather than just information, but knowledge. You know from me how important smoothing the way for somebody else can be, somebody else who's dealing with, like, you know, outside the norm, struggles or even inside the norm struggles because again we are all vulnerable meat sacks so beyond the career related practical reasons uh, that might be a good reason for being a good mentor i'm hoping to appeal to you on that level um, you might not put on 50 pounds every time you're under a lot of stress and trying to hide your learning misfitness because you might not have any um, but we all need folks to support our efforts and uh, to support the efforts of other folks. And, and I'm hoping uh, that you will do this because I, I am why this stuff matters. You are why this stuff matters. And uh, we are, um, to borrow the name of one of my favorite podcasts, we are greater than code. We are why this shit matters. And within your own boundaries, I want to be up here suggesting uh, that you try to facilitate other people learning and growing in their careers. And I'm not saying you have to go in and fix people's food issues, but if you can ease the way in your career with your, your colleagues and that kind of thing, that can help them deal with the other shit that they've got going on. So I started with this to give you examples other than your own, especially if you don't have any, uh, about how easing the code building process can ease up other areas. So now you may be asking, why would anybody hire uh, slow learning Terra? And um, that is an excellent question. Um, but first of all, um, I mean, hopefully, hopefully I'm a nice person and people like being around. That's it. Thank you. Oh my God, I love a ringer. <laughs> Thank you, I'll get you your $20 later. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm a freaking delight. Um, but, but really, I mean, people who experience the world differently see possibilities instead of obstacles, and that is a great trait to have when you're dealing with code. My whole life, uh, in terms of like the food issues and, and the learning thing, it's been, my whole life has been obstacles. And I'm so used to failure, I just keep going. I go back around the barn. If it, didn't, if it wasn't ready to go in the first time, I'm just gonna go back around the barn again. I am a good person to have around. I, I'm gonna dig in there, I'm gonna build your feature, debug your problem, it'll be fine. Um, okay. I'm getting to the practical stuff now. We have circled the barn, and um, Sonia, my first um, engineering mentor, she was my official engineering mentor, um, she uh, 
she paid attention to how I learned. And when we paired one-on-one, -on -one, uh, she would ask me specific questions about uh, the code that we were doing in the context we were doing it. And she would say you know, things like, do you understand what object.method is doing here? That was not their names, they had better names. But do you understand what object.method is doing here? Uh, do you know why we changed that thing to do this thing? And these specific in-context check-ins helped me know that she cared about my progress. And uh, this is where the more traditional imposter syndrome comes in is that I don't even know to this day whether she purposely asked me things that I would know to instill confidence in me or did I just know more than I thought I knew. Uh, it's probably a bit of both, but um, w we just never know these things. But um, I, to, I got to the opportunity to be Sonia's rubber duck, because I really brought very little technical knowledge to the table fresh out of boot camp. Uh, but I, she asked questions of me that weren't really questions she was asking, uh, for herself, not these object.method questions, but asking what she should do next, um, should she be concerned about this thing or that thing, and that taught me what questions a senior engineer would be asking about their code, and it, it was a mentoring process, and even though I was in that silent, mostly silent role of kind of a rubber duck for her, I learned a whole heck of a lot, and so uh, I think one of the things I, I want to give as a, as a takeaway is that, first of all, people can learn from um, folks more seasoned or less seasoned than themselves. So it can be any pairing scenario, but honestly, there is an opportunity to teach and to learn in those pairing sessions, and I hope folks take advantage of that uh, quite a bit, especially if you're helping to uh, level somebody up a bit. I, I want to talk about a different sort of a mentor than I had. I uh, had a variety of colleagues who were all very good at um, helping me answer some of the questions that I had, but I had questions that I, I call of them stupid questions, and you can talk to me later about whether I should ever say that again, but I call them stupid questions. Um, and they were the questions, like there were the questions that I knew like a junior engineer, a newbie would ask. And I asked those of across the team, you know, um, Jeremy, you're here, I asked you all kinds of questions. But what you may or may not know is that I saved my stupid questions for Daryl. Daryl's there on the right. Um, he, uh, stat week, he taught me how to rebase, first of all, which was very exciting. He walked me through my first rebases and he celebrated with me when I did one successfully by myself. He was not there when I nearly passed out when I did something really horrible with a rebase once. But, um, and I, I was literally pale and clammy and texting Carrie Miller from the floor of my apartment, going, I sucked in some code and something happened, um, but Daryl was there for most of my stupid questions. And, and here's, here's what happened, is he established trust with me uh, with this rebase instruction, and then I asked him one of my stupid questions that I knew would reveal that I should not have been hired. And I asked him that, and I asked him not to tell anyone that I asked that question, and he did not tell anyone. Uh, so from then on, I decided this is perfect. I'm going to limit my exposure and I'm going to ask Daryl all of my stupid questions and only one person will know they never should have hired me. And, um, and that is a fantastic technique. What I want to suggest, because most of you maybe already have that first, uh, that first job, is that you establish trust with some of your less seasoned partners, or heck, even your just, you know, same level colleagues, establish trust with them and, uh, and develop a secret pact if you have to. But it's important in order to have those special moments and those people who mean so much to you and level up your career, it's important to first establish trust in order to get to that place. Um, so here's some easy career boon mentoring and rubber ducking. Uh, can have is that once I felt more confident that I had reached at least the within the norm spectrum of junior developers, I confessed the pact 
to our boss. Daryl and I had the same boss, and I told him. Daryl was not my mentor, but he mentored me. And uh, Daryl got promoted. I don't think it was because I told. Um, but it couldn't have hurt. Uh, Daryl was very talented, and so I'm sure that is why he got promoted. But it couldn't hurt that he, even though he was not an official mentor, he mentored the junior developer on the team. And I made sure that his that his boss knew. It was career building for me, and I wanted to make sure it was career building for him. So the takeaway there, I hope probably obviously, is um, certainly you want to show gratitude to those folks who do take the time to care about your learning and keep your secrets that you're asking stupid questions, uh, but also build trust as a potential secret pack provider. It's, it's very important. Uh, this happened recently, and I don't know if you can tell, but like the, it, because the it, the VGA, it's washed out. But can I can I name you in my RubyConf talk? And I get to name him, as you can see. Brian Hall replied, "You can name me as long as it's either good or you're calling me an asshole." <laughs> and this is in Slack. If you do not recognize its its layout there, but Brian was also a different kind of a mentor. Um, Daryl had been. Uh, promoted and moved on to a different team, so I really picked the right person to tell all my secrets to, because he left the team. No one was left on the team who knew I should never have been hired, so that was fantastic. Um, I had a solid footing in coding, and uh, and I didn't pair much with Brian when he worked at Living Social with me. Um, we did some SQL, some Active Record, oh, and we did some jQuery together, uh, but we didn't have a whole lot, because soon enough, the the dark days of the living social layoffs came. And, uh, and we went our separate ways. But fortunately, we continued maintaining uh, Slack with a lot of the living social employees. And so Brian and I kept in touch. And when I started at my new job, I still had coding questions. And of course, I didn't want them to know I was stupid and that they should not. Have. Well, I wasn't stupid. I never thought I was stupid. I just thought I'm a slow learner. And, um, and, and I did think they should have hired me, and I'm glad that they did, but I still didn't want them to know how little I knew in those early days when I was trying to learn all the things and I was stressed out because I don't learn very well. Anyway, I would contact Brian via Slack, and without sharing proprietary information, of course, we would discuss the things that I was working on in code. And uh, soon enough, uh, by the way, he would help me, and that was great, um, but soon enough, we ended up having to reach out because I was asking fewer questions. And that became a milestone that I think was important for me to recognize. And uh, I would suggest that if you find yourself in a similar position where somebody is asking you questions and they start to dwindle, that that's a great thing to point out to them. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but you reach out to me less. You're still welcome to do so, but that's probably a cool thing that you're reaching out less. You probably, you, you're probably feeling more confident. And I, and I was. And then um, it, what happened with, with Brian is uh, he just turned into a real asshole. No, that's not true. It's just because he's, <laughs> he's, he told me. Yeah, no, he didn't. Uh, but he stopped being able to answer my questions because I, uh, I mean, I'm sure he would have been able to if he'd been working on the code with me. Um, but I'd reached a level where I was now working on projects that were, you know, far enough along and asking more technical questions that I finally just sort of, I could no longer just ask him a question and, and, and let, without us being in the same code base, he'd be able to help me. And that, too, was an important milestone, and it was great. He recognized it, um, and... Uh, and it helped me to really acknowledge that as well. That's, that's a pretty exciting thing to realize, especially when you are a vulnerable meat sack who has learning difficulties. It was, it was pretty exciting uh, to realize that. So um, as I've worked with developers newer than me, I've gotten to try out these questions, which I think is kind of fun. And I literally, I, I pinged Slackbot to do this slide. But this is what I send to folks, and you can tell I was up late. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that, was, that was actually early. Um, but I, I send this, this message, and it's a pretty good icebreaker. I mean, it's hard not to smile when you get a mustache and an inquiry. It's hard to turn down somebody who sends this, and I know that because people that I have 
done that with have sent it back to me. I've gotten it back, and it just makes me laugh, and, and I just know this is a person I have a good rapport with, and uh, we're going we're gonna to do some, some mentoring. No, I never think that part, but, um, but that's, what, that's what's happening. Uh, that is what is happening, and okay, we've only got three more slides. We're, we're coming down to it, I, I promise. Um, so I've tried to suggest that uh, caring about the vulnerable meat sacks uh, that surround you might be a motivator for asking good questions and being a trustworthy mentor, uh, but also becoming a better version of yourself is a good reason, a, a motivator to be a good mentor or a good rubber duck. Everyone uh, can learn from good questions, including the person asking them. And um, mentoring can be as easy as answering stupid questions and keeping them secret. I don't know if I clarified that, but he, don't tell anybody. I did eventually, by the way, tell Daryl that, um, that I had told our boss so that he could bring that up in his one-on-ones and performance evaluations. <laughs> uh, but if none of that human stuff motivates you, I do want you to remember that Daryl did get a promotion. Uh, so that's good. Okay, one more circle around the barn. Back in the PhD days, oh my God, you cannot even see that fucking owl. Um, <laughs> trust me, this is a really great slide. <laughs> okay, uh, back in the PhD days, um, I, I took a few feminist theory classes and that shit bored me to tears. I still don't really know what was happening in those classes, but the significance was totally lost on me. Um, I didn't know why it was important. It made no sense to me. This is maybe why I failed the PhD exams. No, the actually women's studies was not one of my areas of concentration, so it was fine. Um, but uh, let, I never could have imagined that joining the tech industry would teach me so much about feminist theory. And lest you think that I am going uh, somewhere else with this, it's, it's this community, uh, especially the Ruby community, from what I can tell from the various uh, conferences I've attended and people that I've talked to, but it's this community that's taught me to see commonalities alongside difference, uh, to learn better communication in the presence of difference, and to appreciate difference. And a series of mentors, both formal and informal, have helped me level up to a place where I get to learn more about my betrayer body and then reveal it to a large crowd of, of folks in, in this setting. And uh, most of all, to I've learned that being able to appreciate difference is so important to me. And um, you have all inspired me to share what I've gotten from you to, so that I can return it all back to you. Um, and so I'm sharing this because I want you all to keep this shit up uh, and in a more conscious ways even than you have already and expand on it and grow because it, it, is, it has been so life-changing for me. I'm, a, I'm eternally grateful for it. And uh, you give me hope that we can all treat one another in a way that honors our differences uh, rather than hiding them. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. Okay, I've shared some stories. I've offered some specific questions to ask uh, of others and of yourselves. And I hope that you give your best for yourselves and for those around you. And I am, again, deeply thankful that you have all been my rubber ducks at least for a half hour or so. So uh, thank you very much. I don't, I have no idea if I have time for questions um, and I don't, really have to dash, um, but I do have stickers there if anybody is interested in those. And I do have a question if nobody else has a question. By the way, I'm totally blind up here, so you'll have to say something if you have a question. You have about 10 minutes. Oh, I have 10 minutes. Okay, I'm going to start because I've already got the mic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yay. Um, I do have a question because I thought of this far too late, and some of my slides don't translate well for visually impaired folks, but I went to slide share, I think, and I couldn't add captions or anything um, to my slides. And I was, if anybody has like a tool that they know where I can like post my slides, but add captions to them so that people who can't see my awesome pictures, like you, none of you could see the owl, um, then that would be great if you might tweet that at me. My, Oh my gosh, you can't even see my Twitter account.
Excellent. Media Remedial is my, is my Twitter handle, and thank you, Jennifer. Um, so that was my question. Are there any others? Uh, that that is a really good question, especially I I am consider it, considering um, I think most people have heard about mansplaining before, and nobody no nobody should go there. Um, I I think I think one of the best things to do is to put the how do I put this? There's a there's a balance of power. Uh, there is a power structure that comes into play with the more seasoned engineer and the not a seasoned engineer, and th that could be just in say this one particular scenario. And I think a great thing is to put the action and the uh, power for that action in the other person. So even just asking a question, I I'm a big fan of questions. Just let um, you know I. I know a, a bit about Ember JS components. Would you would you like to talk about that, or some question in that way? And there, I'm more than happy to hear from other folks in the audience who have ideas. But for me, asking a question and asking whether they want that assistance is a great place to start. Certainly, do not start with well, actually. <laughs> I don't care who's involved in the situation. Don't start that way. <laughs> I, I was going to try to recap it, but now I, you've lost me. It. I noticed you flailing. Um, but I was going to recap it a bit for, for the video presentation. But um, I, we were asked, how do you know when to step in? And one of the suggestions from the back of the room that I can't see uh, was that you ask you know, what the person is doing or how, how they're doing, and, and they can explain what they're working on in a very neutral way, and then they will, as you as you mentioned, get to the part. Uh, maybe they'll just get to the part where they're flailing about, right? You don't actually have to say that. Uh, and that, that the uh, shout out right before that, and what you've said is great. I'm kind of going to recap it a little bit, which is just that on the one hand, if you're asking um, what they're working on and how they're doing it, then you might just end up being a rubber duck. They may, during the course of explaining it, figure out what's going wrong for themselves. Or, as Betsy points out, uh, where they are struggling might be due to um, how they're understanding what's going on. And they, because they're explaining to you in the way that they understand things, you might get a clue on what they actually might need some assistance on. So that's excellent. Thank you. I really like having Sam in a meeting. Uh, <laughs> so the suggestion, which I'm repeating for the sake of audio, is uh, that if you have an opportunity, to, you see someone you think might be struggling in a particular way, and uh, you are willing to do it, ask the question you think that they want to ask but might be a little nervous about asking. And uh, that also, I think, builds that trust as well. Even if they don't know for sure that you did that on their half, they know you're a person who has similar questions, and that itself can build, build a bond. So I, I think that's great. How much time do I have left? Anybody know? There's like this huge... Okay, I'm done. Yay, I lived! Woo! <laughs>